Thank you, Nora Leonard, and, and thank all of you for coming here today and joining us at ADDF in this really important uh, issue and effort to find effective drugs for Alzheimer's disease. Um, let's get right to work. Uh, I want to talk about, since it's fashion week last week, I want to start off with how Alzheimer's disease was discovered. <clears throat> now, in the, in the mid-19th century, there was the, uh, uh, the beginning of, of modern chemistry. And the first place that modern chemistry, or one of the first places that modern chemistry was applied was in new textiles, new dyes for, for clothes. Prior to that, there were only natural dyes. And so some of the chemists synthesized the dye, that, that purple dye that you see on, on this lady in this famous painting. And the, part of the painting was because of the dye was so novel at the time, we couldn't really make purple dresses. The dye is called an aniline dye. And it was an aniline dye, basically the same dye that was used to color dresses at the time, that Alzheimer used to discover Alzheimer's disease. He took advantage of a discovery in 1893 of the modern microscope. And then he applied this dye, which was called Congo Red. The reason was that things, Europe was, was um, totally onto the Congo at the time. It was, it, was, it was a very popular thing to talk about. So the discoverers called the dye for the dress Congo Red. And Alzheimer took Congo Red. And he, when his patient, um, Auguste, who you see on the right, um, she came to him, she was 52 years old, and she was clearly demented. He knew that it was abnormal. She was losing her mind. As a German physician, he took care of her. And at the, as a physician scientist, when she died, he actually performed her autopsy. And he looked under that new microscope, stained the tissue with um, Congo Red. And what he saw in the brain was not only the shrinkage that occurred in the area that you see here, which is called the hippocampus, which is the area of the brain responsible for memory and learning. But he also saw, in, under the microscope, the famous plaques and tangles that you see here. So this would be the senile plaques that stained positive with the Congo red. It showed up. And he knew that was abnormal. And the dying neurons, which we see here, um, which he called tangles because of the way they looked. So the plaques and tangles characterized the disease. He reported this in 1906 at a major meeting in Europe. A a young person with dementia who had plaques and tangles in their brain, that was Alzheimer's disease. Now today, the plaques and tangles have become the major source of clues for how we discover drugs for Alzheimer's disease. But let me tell you that in the year that I started medical school, which was 1970, nothing was known about Alzheimer's disease. Between 1906 and 1970, in fact, 1976, there was no research on Alzheimer's disease. In the 1970s, when we had the war on cancer and billions of dollars were being spent on the, at the NIH on heart disease and cancer, my mentor, Robert Butler, who was the founder of the National Institute on Aging, told me that when he first got there, he did a survey of the NIH to see how much money was being spent on Alzheimer's research. And he found out that as a government, as a society, in 1976, we were spending $625 thousand dollars on 12 grants, all of them caregiver grants, no research. So um, by research on this disease really began in the early 1980s. And the reason I tell you that historical perspective is because we've had insulin for diabetes since the 1920s. We've had drugs for hypertension since the 1930s. We are late to the game, but I am confident to say that we know as much about how Alzheimer's disease happens today as we know about heart disease and cancer. But because of that historical lag time, this is the time to translate that biology into new drugs. And that's what I want to talk about for the rest of, the, of our session here today. Now, Alzheimer's disease, we know now, is the most common cause of dementia in older people. <clears throat> about 70% of the cases have Alzheimer's disease in their brain. So what is dementia? I often get asked that. And how do we differ that in, as clinicians from normal aging? Well, let me just say really briefly that normal aging involves some memory problems, a slowing of our, our processing speed, our ability to multitask. <clears throat> and, but, but it differs remarkably from what happens to Alzheimer patients who develop amnesia. Um, they can't remember things. They don't register things. So if you tell them five words, they really can't repeat them anymore. 
So there's different kinds of memory. Their ability to register words gets lost. Um, and, and this is a terrible symptom for caregivers because their loved one is asking them 10, 15 times a day the same question. And that's one of the earliest and most annoying and dis disabling early symptoms. But the other thing about dementia is that it's Alzheimer's disease is not just about memory loss. There are many other symptoms that are disabling and cause functional impairment. And in this slide, I show you a big word called agnosia. And that's a symptom, a neurological term, which represents the inability of people to recognize. So when we see something, part of our brain says, I know what that is. If it's an orange, we see it. We register it as an orange. We know what it is. It's a food. People with agnosia, as their brain is disconnecting, they're not blind. They can see the orange, but they can't put the information in their database together that it's, it, it is an orange and that it's food. And in this slide, you see a man who's looking in the mirror, <clears throat> and he can see himself in the mirror, but he can't recognize himself. And, and that, we see that a lot in Alzheimer patients, that loved ones are so upset when mom doesn't recognize her husband or her daughter anymore. In the nursing home, what happens? We see people trying to eat their spoons and that kind of thing. But I often get asked, why is Alzheimer's a fatal disease? And if you look at this picture, you see an elderly woman who's probably been feeding herself since the age of three or four who's being fed. Why is she being fed? Because she has another neurological symptom called apraxia. Apraxia means that for every task that's complicated that we do in life, bathing, dressing, using a telephone, we have to be able to sequence the task. So if I want to tie my shoes, I have to get my shoes, I have to pu pull up my, my shoelaces, and I have to do the motor task. This woman is not pa pa um, paralyzed, but she can't do the cognitive component of recognizing the food, of, br of bringing the, the, uh, the, you know, bringing the food to her, her mouth um, by a fork and then swallowing it. Ultimately, what happens to people as a result of things like apraxia and agnosia is they stop eating, they can't feed themselves, and if they're not properly fed, the food goes in their lungs, they develop pneumonia, and the most common cause of death in Alzheimer's disease is pneumonia. People die from pneumonia because the food gets in their lungs or they can't clear their lungs. So Alzheimer's disease is a fatal, a uniformly fatal, chronic progressive neurodegenerative disease. <clears throat> Now, one thing that's happened in the last year, in the last couple of years, that's really an amazing advance in my mind is early diagnosis. Imagine if we could actually see the amyloid plaques, the senile plaques, in the brains of living people and for certain make the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. So in the past, when I saw people 20, 30 years ago, you know, it was said that I could have an 80 or 90 percent certainty that I could say that somebody who, as Leonard mentioned, for example, only had memory loss, which is mild cognitive impairment, memory loss greater than we would expect for their age, an early symptom of Alzheimer's disease, but not dementia. We want to make an early diagnosis. Imagine if I could actually see the plaques. I'll tell you a, small, a short story. In 1999, I got a call from a doctor at the University of Pennsylvania. He said he had a crazy idea. He said he thought he could take a, a molecule, inject it, and then light it up on a PET scan, which is available all over the country, and make the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, because that molecule would go into the brain and bind the amyloid plaques and show up on the PET scan. Uh, we funded that project for four years at the University of Pennsylvania from 2000 to 2004. In 2005, Dan Skrivansky, who was an MD, PhD student who was earning, we paid him $35,000 a year to work on this project. That was his salary. He spun out a company called Avid Radio Pharmaceuticals in 2005 as a result of our funding. In 2010, that company was sold to Eli Lilly for $800 million. And in April of 2012, that little company, that little David, beat the Goliath of General Electric, which was working on a similar project. And, and that test became approved by the FDA in April of 2012. And uh, experts like myself are using that test to definitively diagnose Alzheimer's disease in patients. And I can tell you there's some controversy today about Medicare paying for the test. Most experts think, who have used it, that it's very valuable. And I do hope that Medicare will pay for the test. <clears throat> but it is available in the clinic. Now, the other advantage and the great advance of this test and others like it is that it's accelerating drug development because now we can actually see 
Alzheimer's disease. We've learned from the test that 30% of people who are entered into clinical trials, and they cost three to $400 million for each trial, that 30% of the people who are entered into these trials don't even have Alzheimer's disease. Their scan is negative. Secondly, we can use the test as what we call a biomarker in the trials in phase two to see if an anti-amyloid drug works. And you can see here that in the top, that the patient who got, I'm sorry, in the bottom, the patient who got placebo, that red means there's more amyloid. <clears throat> and you can see that over the course of 18 months, this patient progressed in their Alzheimer's disease because there was more amyloid. And this patient who got a vaccine to get rid of the amyloid, actually um, the amyloids seemed to reduce in, in size. But all of the anti-amyloid therapies that Big Pharma and, and others have been developing and billions and billions of dollars have been spent on this have thus far failed. And it may be that the amyloid just really represents a scar in the brain as a result of another neurodegenerative process. And so about four or five years ago, our foundation decided um, not to fund any more, strategically not to fund any more anti-amyloid programs. Um, now, one novel approach that we did fund four or five years ago was to fund a biotech company called Prana in Melbourne, Australia. They had a drug called PBT2, and they ran a phase two study. And um, it was actually one of the most positive studies that we've seen so far in clinical development. The reason is because they actually had an effect on patients' ability to think, on cognition. And not just memory, but also what we call executive function, which is very important. It involves planning and abstract reasoning and, and these kinds of things and judgment. So they had a positive phase two trial. The next thing would be to do a much larger trial <clears throat> and to uh, try to prove that it really works. And the company has been trying to raise money um, all over the world from big pharma and other people. And they just haven't been able to do it. Why? Because People saw this as risky. Um, it just didn't fit with the mechanism of action. The mechanism of action is, is thought to be a little unusual. They came to us. A public company came to us. Um, we gave them a mission-related investment. And you can see here that just recently, the drug was named as one of the top 10 to watch. And they just completed um, enrollment in their trial. And we hope that sometime in, in 2014, we'll have the results of the trial. They're using a PET scan as the primary outcome to see if the drug actually affects the brain. And they can confirm some of the original results on cognition. So this is an, an example of where ADDF came in where others wouldn't tread to take a risk on a project that seems very exciting. The thing is that what causes dementia, what causes people to lose their minds, is when the neurons die and the connections disconnect. And this is a, a slide of a normal neuron here. And you can see there's a lot of connections. And as the neurons degenerate, the connections start to disintegrate. The synapses, the, the connections between neurons <coughs> uh, disappear. And then the neurons ultimately die, and they form the tangles. So the tangles are the dying neurons. And I can tell you that drugs to protect the neurons from dying are in development today. There are a number of programs that we're funding and that others are funding around the world, and also programs to try to prevent these connections, these axons, what are called axons, from disintegrating. Now, the tangles actually, interestingly, start in the area of the brain, that hippocampus that I showed you in the, one of the first slides. And they start there. This was discovered many years ago. And they spread in a very fairly reproducible pattern throughout the brain. And as they spread, those symptoms like agnosia and apraxia occur because those areas of the brain begin to get affected. <clears throat> and actually, compared to the amyloid scan, by the time somebody has MCI or dementia, their brains are pretty much filled with amyloid. And the, actually, the, the amount of amyloid in the brain by the time somebody is sick doesn't really correlate with progression. But the tangles do, obviously, because as the cells die, we, lo we lose cognitive function. So um, first of all, this, this idea of spreading is a new advance in our thinking. And it's just occurred in the last couple of years. And now there are vaccines, new vaccines, against a molecule in the tangles called tau, which plays an important role in the connections and those axons that I mentioned. And ADDF is, is funding some of these vaccines that are to, to try to slow the spreading of the disease, to catch people who have only the memory loss and prevent the disease from spreading throughout the brain, and also drugs to prevent the tangles or the neurons from dying and the tangles from happening. One of the drugs that's done this, um, presumed that, that acts in this way, is a drug called Rember. <clears throat> 
Now, Claude Wishick is the founder of Remer, and he's the champion. And he's been on this thing for, I'd say, 15 years. The Remer is actually a very old drug. It's been around since the 1890s. In the 1920s and 30s, it was used to treat malaria. It's a dye. It's a dye called methylene blue. Um, it was one of the first psychotropics that were used in people with schizophrenia for, as an antipsychotic. Um, <clears throat> and uh, Claude showed, and I don't have time to show you this, but Claude showed that this drug actually could prevent the tangles. And he did a phase two study. Now, there's a couple of things that's interesting about this phase two study. So here you have decline in cognition over time, and this is almost a two-year period. And you can see the placebo goes down more rapidly than people that were on this optimal dose of Rember. <clears throat> so this would be how we would define in a clinical trial what a disease-modifying drug is as opposed to a symptomatic agent. And the FDA recognizes this that if we can show with a drug that it changes the slope of decline, then that would tell us that it's a disease-modifying drug. Now again, Claude went to big pharma, to venture capital people all over the world. He could not raise any money. And he ultimately raised, interestingly, about $150 million of money from private donors, from private people, from foundations to fund this trial. And that was the only way that that trial could move forward was through philanthropy and private donors. Why, again, pharma is risk averse. They're not willing to take the early stage risks that are necessary. <clears throat> Another new advance that has just happened in the last year is imagine if we could see the tangles on a brain scan in living people that we wouldn't have to wait for the autopsy. So, the same company that I told you about, Avid Radio Pharmaceuticals, now has a tangle agent. Patients go in, they get injected with a marker, another derivative of another dye. It goes up into the brain and it lights up the tangles. This is, I think, a major advance, not only in diagnosis, <clears throat> because we can actually see people, for example, if somebody came into my office and they just had mild cognitive impairment, just memory loss, it's actually difficult for me to know which way they're going to go because 50% of people with mild cognitive impairment will become demented in three to five years, but 50% of people won't. They actually can be made better, and I have several, a number of patients, 50% of my patients, who I can actually make better when they come see me. Now, we can do that with the amyloid scan, but with the tangle scan, I think we're going to get better correlations. And here's a patient, for example, that has MCI, so they just have memory problems. Their amyloid scan was positive, and you're just beginning to see here this green light up in the hippocampus of the tangles. We're seeing the tangles, and then as the disease progresses. So this is going to be useful in clinical trials as a marker to see if a drug that prevents the neurons from dying can slow down the progression of the tangles. Amazing. Now, we need to learn from aging because aging is the leading risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. Now, what happens with aging? Well, a lot of things happen with aging. Our foundation is trying to learn from aging to develop new drugs for Alzheimer's disease. Um, and, and there's a whole science around this called gerontology. And on, the, on, on, this, on, on, your, on the right of the slide here, you see a, 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 a quart of milk, and we've all seen milk curdle. Why does curdling happen? It's because proteins need to be in the right shape to function. They need to be in the right shape to function. <clears throat> and when proteins go into the wrong shape, they don't function, they aggregate, and they basically curdle. And that's why milk curls when it goes bad. The same thing is happening in the brain. In fact, the amyloid plaques, the amyloid that's in the plaques, is really a curdled or a misfolded form of a normal protein called beta amyloid, whose function we're not sure about, we, but we think it plays a role in memory. And the tangles are also made up of misfolded proteins of a protein called tau, as I mentioned, that's in the, in the connections. So one thing we'd like to do is prevent the misfolding of proteins in the brain. And the other thing that happens, why does the banana turn brown? The banana turns brown because it's being oxidized when you leave it out on a shelf and it sits around for a week. It's being oxidized. And we who live on Earth under the sun are constantly at risk and constantly being oxidized for other reasons. Oxygen is an oxidant, and we depend on oxygen for life. It's throughout our bodies. So through evolution over many millions of years, all life on Earth 
has developed antioxidants. What's the reason why plants have the best antioxidants? It's because they live in the sun 24-7. And with mother nature, evolution, the best chemist in the world, developed the best antioxidants. And that's why we need to learn from mother nature to develop better antioxidants. ADDF is funding programs to prevent the misfolding by taking care of these evolutionary properties of our, our own bodies, which, where we have what are called chaperones to prevent misfolding, and to create better antioxidants. Most of the antioxidants that you take, that we take, almost all of them have never been shown to be effective for anything. But we st so we need better antioxidants, and we need antioxidants that get in the brain, because most antioxidants that really would work in, in our brains don't actually get in the brain. So we're funding programs, <clears throat> and we actually have one clinical trial going on, of, a, of, of, of novel antioxidants that might prevent the progression of Alzheimer's disease. Now, we get these bad proteins in our brains. They're misfolded, they're oxidized, they don't function anymore, they aggregate. And when they aggregate like that, they become toxic, and they kill brain cells. So again, through evolution, we're constantly getting damaged proteins as we live on Earth over 80 years, misfolded proteins and, and oxidized proteins that we need to get rid of. So Mother Nature developed a garbage disposal system in all of our cells, big word called autophagy. That's the scientific term for how our cells get rid of those damaged proteins. It happens every day. But with aging, autophagy slows down, and there's a theory that maybe autophagy, that the inability to clear these damaged proteins leads to their buildup and kills the cells. So ADDF and, and others, um, and the National Institute on Aging, for example, is funding the development <clears throat> of new drugs to try and enhance autophagy, to help our cells, especially in the brain, to clear these damaged proteins and prevent cell death. Another thing that we've learned over the last 20 years, 20 years ago we learned that there's a powerful, very powerful genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's disease called ApoE. Apolipoprotein E is really interesting because it carries cholesterol, and in the brain, it's critical for brain cell repair. So when a brain cell gets damaged, um, another cell in the brain makes this ApoE, it carries cholesterol over to the damaged cell, and it helps the cell to repair itself. <clears throat> now, there are three types of ApoE, ApoE2, ApoE3, and ApoE4. ApoE3 is the most common type and works normally. ApoE2 is actually protective. ApoE4 is really bad. So 20% of the population inherited at least one 4 gene from a mother or father. And 60% of people with Alzheimer's disease have an ApoE4 gene. <clears throat> so we've known about this genetic risk factor for 20 years. We know that people who have ApoE4 get the disease 10 years earlier than people who, who don't have it. And the average age of onset is 76, 78. People with ApoE will get the disease in their early 60s, a in the late 60s, a very powerful evidence for ApoE4. 20 years, we've known the genetics, no drugs. And I'd like to say that because I want to illustrate to you how hard it is that biology is one form of science, and we know a lot about the biology of Alzheimer's disease. But drug discovery is a completely different science, completely different. It takes completely different types of scientists, particularly medicinal chemists. It's chemists who make the drugs. It's not biologists. And we need to know the pathways, and we need to make these drugs so that we can take them by mouth, so they get in the brain, and they're effective. <clears throat> so. We need to develop drugs to fix ApoE, and with the help of the Renee and Robert Belfer Foundation, we started an ApoE therapeutics program, and I think it's fair to say we have one of the largest portfolios in development for fixing ApoE, and one of the most exciting things we're doing right now is funding a Dr. Steve Paul, who used to be the head of NIMH, the National Institute of Mental Health, and the vice president for R&D at Eli Lilly. He's now a professor at Cornell, and he's doing gene therapy to fix the ApoE4, by giving people ApoE2, which is the protective form of ApoE. And so we are funding him to develop a gene therapy that will fix the ApoE4 problem. We're also funding a number of other programs around the world to try to fix the ApoE problem and, and, and protect people from getting early, uh, getting Alzheimer's disease. <clears throat> now, we've had drugs for diabetes for a long time. And the brain is critically dependent on glucose. So if any of you know diabetics, you know that if their glucose level gets below about 60 or so, the first thing that happens almost immediately is they go unconscious. And if you give them a little orange juice, they wake up like that. 
And the reason for that is that although the brain represents only 3% of the body weight, it uses 25% of the body's energy, both oxygen and particularly glucose. The brain is completely dependent on glucose. Now, the brain, with aging, gets insulin resistance. That means that it can't use glucose as effectively. If the brain, doesn't, if the brain cells, if the neurons don't have energy, ultimately they dysfunction and die. So protecting or improving insulin resistance in the brain, learning from diabetes, and taking diabetes drugs and using them in Alzheimer's disease is a good way for us to try to find drugs to protect against Alzheimer's disease. And that process of taking drugs that are already approved for other diseases and using them for Alzheimer's disease is called repurposing. So we are repurposing a number of diabetes drugs in clinical trials uh, for Alzheimer's disease. Metformin, the most popular, widely used drug for diabetes. We've already run a clinical trial at Columbia University with metformin that has had positive results that have recently been reported in a phase two study. And we're funding a trial at the Imperial College of London in a big partnership with General Electric and Novo Nordisk and the Alzheimer's Society of the United Kingdom to test another drug for Alzheimer's uh, for, that is re repurposed from, um, from diabetes called liraglutide. And we also repositioned a drug. So there, was, there were champions at Upjohn of a drug called mitoglitazone. And when Pfizer bought Upjohn in Kalamazoo, Michigan, they fired all these guys. And these guys said, no, wait a second. We have this great drug called mitoglitazone, which is a diabetes drug. It's not approved. We need to develop it for diabetes. They, they formed a company called Metabolic Solutions, and they started developing the drug for diabetes. We came to them and said, we want you to do this for Alzheimer's disease. They said to us, we have limited money, we're a small biotech company, and our board will not let us divert any funds from our efforts in diabetes to Alzheimer's disease. <clears throat> they were already in phase two and had safety data, so they already had the potential to do this in human beings. We gave them money in an animal model, they showed it worked, then we said to them, let's go right to a phase two, we funded them for a phase two, this study was just reported at our annual meeting, our 14th annual meeting. And what you see here is that the people who got the placebo, blue means the brain is getting cold. It's a PET scan that measures glucose utilization in the brain. And you can see on this slide here that the brain is getting cold in critical areas where we think, including the hippocampus. And over this period of three months, the people who got mitoglitazone, there was no change. So it's really looking like this drug might work for Alzheimer's disease, and we're very excited, and they're trying to fund, uh, raise more money now to test mitoglitazone in, in a larger study for Alzheimer's disease while they're also doing their diabetes research. Um, the white matter, we've also discovered recently, really matters in Alzheimer's disease. There are drugs to try to slow white matter degeneration. The white matter is where the long connections are. The brain is disconnecting. The white matter is falling apart. The white matter is mostly made out of fat, DHA is critical to the white matter. We could talk about that later. Um, but there's been studies of DHA supplementation for Alzheimer's disease. But I think the most important thing about the white matter today is the issue of hypertension. Now, the white matter is supplied poorly by the blood vessels because it's deep in the brain. And so when people have hypertension, they get ischemia, small ischemia, not big strokes, but small ischemia. And <clears throat> the cells die. Um, and we know that white matter, these white matter lesions, which you see here on MRI, which we used to think were nothing and benign, we know now are associated with cognitive decline. They rapidly accelerate Alzheimer's disease. They may even be part of the Alzheimer's disease process. There have been studies showing that if you control hypertension, you can actually reduce the risk of dementia, both Alzheimer's disease and stroke. And um, what we're doing is repurposing hypertension drugs. And there's specific hypertension drugs that are neuroprotective. And I won't go into the chemistry and the biology of why that is, but there are specific hypertension drugs that are neuroprotective and can be used to protect the white matter, even in people that don't have hypertension. <clears throat> and we're using, in the clinical trial that we're funding at the University of Toronto through our affiliate that we've recently created called ADF Canada, a study to see if these neuroprotective antihypertensives can reduce white matter lesions in people that already have them. Uh, and we're also funding another study in the European Commission. Let me close fairly quickly because I think my time is running out here. But I've talked to you about medical factors. Um, maybe in the Q&A we can talk about all the lifestyle factors that we can do. My soundbite to you was everything that you think about to prevent heart disease, 
you can also probably do to prevent yourself from getting Alzheimer's disease. Leonard mentioned the need for funding. The deaths from heart disease and cancer are going down. Alzheimer deaths are going up rapidly. Um, but here's the funding situation. Basically, right now, about 30,000 people die from HIV AIDS. About a million people are affected. It's a totally preventable disease. It's also a totally treatable chronic illness. Number of deaths from HIV AIDS is going down. We spend, as a society, $3,200 per patient with HIV AIDS per year on research. We spend $120 per patient per year on research for Alzheimer's disease. I don't understand why. I think it's ageism. I think we don't value people. But maybe it's also that historical perspective. Um, I don't know. Maybe, maybe we need to change that. ADDF is changing that. And I'll just show you this slide to show you it with data how we're unique. <clears throat> there was an international survey that was done of funding agencies um, looking at projects and categorizing them. Were they biology? Were they drug discovery? Were they diagnostic? The red is drug discovery and clinical development. This maroon is diagnostics. I think you can see it from this independent survey that was done by the National Institutes on Health and the Alzheimer's Association that we're different. We solely fund drug discovery and development, and we're different from all these other agencies in doing so. So let me conclude by saying that today, with these scans and other measures, we can make an early diagnosis and a definitive diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. There are many disease-modifying drugs in clinical trials today and in preclinical drug discovery that are very exciting. And I think we're going to see many of these get into clinical trials. And I'm very hopeful and excited that some of these are going to affect the course of Alzheimer's disease and be approved by the FDA in the coming five years. And I do think that um, Alzheimer's can be prevented today. And thank you very much for your attention. Appreciate it.